The United States economy grew at the amazing rate of 4.1 percent. We are on track to hit the highest annual average growth rate in over 13 years. And I will say this right now, and I'll say it strongly, as the trade deals come in one by one, we're going to go a lot higher than these numbers, and these are great numbers. So on Friday, the Trump administration announced some impressive GDP numbers. Now economists are posing the question, are they sustainable? Uh, also, consumers are starting to see higher prices on things like soda and beer in response to recent tariffs on metal. So we are joined now by Martin Neal Bailey, Chair in Economic Policy Development and a Senior Fellow in Economic Studies at Brookings. He also served as Economic Advisor to President Bill Clinton. Nice to have you, sir. Thank you. Nice to be here. So put these numbers in context uh, for what was achieved, say, during the Clinton administration or, or in other presidencies. Well, during the Clinton administration, we had very strong economic growth, much stronger, really, than has been achieved since the Great Recession. So we got good numbers. You know, it was, it was a strange feeling. You'd go in and tell the president or, or tell the, the cabinet each quarter that you got another, another great number. It was a fun position to uh, be in. Unfortunately, growth has slowed down since then, and really since about 2004, we haven't had that kind of strong growth. So now uh, the question is, um, is that we, we got one quarter of 4.1, uh, and that's a very good number. And I think we probably will get <clears throat> something close to 3% this year, maybe even a little above 3% this year. So that is better than we've had for the last uh, few years. So the economy in terms of economic growth is doing better. Yeah, as you saw that the presence of the best in 13 years, uh, what would you attribute this to? Because clearly, I mean, what, to con compare it to the 90s, okay, fine, but if it's going in the right, right. direction now, I think people want to know why. Um, I think there are two reasons. I think President Trump was able to sort of inspire and encourage the business community. They, they were not that fond of President Obama. They thought he put in too many regulations. Whether those things did uh, the things they, they were worried about, we can debate. But it, in any case, there was a sort of feeling that uh, the, the government was, was not on, in tune with business. And, and Trump came in and changed that perception. But then the other thing that was done, obviously, was the tax cut. Um, and that has lowered corporate taxes. Uh, and so that is encouraging business uh, investment. Uh, and there were some other tax cuts as well. But the main reason I think we are getting strong growth is that it was a kind of Keynesian stimulus. It mm. was a boosting of the economy. Um, and that is something I think we can, we can question whether how good an idea that is and an economy that was already approach, approaching full employment. Well, let me ask you this. How much do these numbers, these sort of macroeconomic top line numbers, relate to the experience of average Americans? Because at the same time that you're seeing businesses happy, stock markets high, GDP growth, you see wages continuing to be stagnant, in many cases falling during the same period. So is, is it just the case that the experience for average Americans has become divorced from those sort of top line numbers overall? To a degree, it has. Um, yes, I think that, that even though we've had sort of OK growth, not great growth for the last 10 years or so since the, since the recovery from the recession, it hasn't gone down uh, to workers' living standards, wages, and so on. And so many families are still finding that they, they have a squeeze. And that's been true, I would have to say, for quite a while Decades, now. since the 70s. Really, for a long time, that the, the folks in the top 10% or even the folks in the top 1% have been getting most of the gains in income that we've uh, seen. So I think that's a very serious concern. Well, how do we change that? Well, that's a tough one. Um, I think, first of all, we have to believe that that's a good thing to do. And I'm not sure this administration is really that, that uh, interested in doing that. I think they sort of feel you know, just get government out of the way and everything will work fine. So the kinds of things that one might do, improving training, improving education, um, I think those things are not on the top of the agenda. Now, President Trump did say he wanted more apprenticeship, so he, he did mention that. There hasn't been a lot of money put, uh, put behind that. Martin, what do you think of the president's approach on trade? He's been getting a lot of pushback from both sides of the aisle, but He's also announced the early stages of an agreement with the EU, perhaps for them to lessen their tariffs. How do you think this is working out? Where do you think it's going? 
I think his approach is terrible. I mean, he's insulted our allies, um, and, and that's not a, a good idea. Uh, I was pleased that he was able to come to some kind of agreement with the EU, uh, so that's helpful, and let's hope that goes in, in that right direction. Um, I do think previous administrations maybe could have done more in terms of the, the trade deals. I think when China was admitted to the WTO, that maybe uh, there should have been provisions that phased in so that, that we didn't get that rather quick uh, loss of jobs in manufacturing in the United States. So I think there were mistakes that were made in the past. And taking a tough line uh, with China on, on intellectual protection, I think that's a, a good idea. So I don't, I'm not criticizing everything that's done, mm -hmm. but the sort of scatter shop, let's put up on tariffs, let's insult people, that I don't think well, what is would a good be a, What would be a it. mechanism for getting Chinese cooperation short of tariffs, for getting the Chinese to back off? We've been asking them to not do things for a long time. Asking them clearly won't work. Well, uh, I think that, that uh, restrictions, I mean, some of the things that are being done on restricting access of uh, Chinese companies to technology here in the U.S., so that was already uh, happening. So they can't just buy a technology company, uh, borrow, uh, steal the patents and take them back to, uh, back to in China. In part for national security concerns. For, it's not for just national con uh, security concerns. But I, but I also think that we have to recognize that the chi China is an upcoming country and that uh, you know they are going to be gaining on us in some of these uh, some of these industries. Moreover, the big trade deficit, which is the big complaint that uh, that Trump has, yes, it's a little bit the fault of China. It's a little bit the fault of Europe. There are things that they could do, but on the other hand, a lot of it is our own fault. Uh, we need to do something about the fact that we're spending a lot more than we're producing. We don't save much as an economy. If we really are serious about trying to reduce the trade deficit, which I think we should be, then we have to address that problem here at home. Well, and in a similar vein, some job loss and manufacturing job loss has been caused by what you said, or sort of mistakes that we've made in terms of trade, but a lot has been caused also by automation. Is that a trend that long-term you're concerned about in this country? Well, I'm not sure what you can uh, do about it. I mean, we've always had automation. We've always lost jobs because of automation. If you go back uh, to the 19th or 18th century even, you, you see that same effect. So I don't think, unless we just cut ourselves off and say we're not, gonna, uh, we're not gonna try to raise productivity, we're not gonna invest, of course we don't wanna do those things. Right. We want to change a changing economy. Um, and that's going to mean uh, a decline in manufacturing jobs, I think. I don't think, at least as a share of the total, we may be able to add a few jobs. We are, have been adding a few jobs in the last year or so. Um, but manufacturing jobs as a share of the total is probably going to go down. So the question is, what are our workers going to do? And, right. and we, we talked about that a moment ago. Um, they need skills. I mean, you know, if, if, you're a, if you're a carpenter or a plumber or you can service an automobile, you can make a pretty good living in, in the U.S. So we need to find other jobs for folks to do. And it's not just becoming a computer programmer. Um, you know, healthcare has been growing dramatically. And right. so actually one, that's one reason uh, so many women are seeing uh, jobs for them and higher jobs. Uh, so the relative wages of women has gone up in the last several years. Right. So there are other jobs, other potential, if we can find people the skills. And people have to take some responsibility. They have to go to school. They have to learn these yeah. uh, skills. Although a lot of the jobs that are, we're seeing in healthcare are fairly low paying jobs. So maybe lifting that floor as well is something we can explore. But we some really- Some of them are, but Wait, you know, can you, can you just give me a, a grade for Trump and the economy real quick before we go? A grade. A Come grade. On. Oh, C, okay. B plus, A uh, plus. C plus. C plus. All right. Uh, Mr. Bailey, thank you so thank much. You so much. We appreciate your input. Oh, your man. insights thank are really you. valuable. Thank you. Somebody forgot, forgot their homework, apparently. All right, next up on Rising, it's the anniversary of Medicare and Medicaid being signed into law. What's the current state of those programs, and what does the future potentially look like? An expert from the Medicare Rights Center gives us a look. And later on, Team Rising, they join us to help decode all the latest headlines.